Hey. Oh, that's my cat sneezing. My cat has a cold. Well, he doesn't have a cold. He has, uh, he has FIV. Um, FIV is the feline equivalent of HIV. Feline immunodeficiency virus. Um, he got it because he got bit. He got a little bit in the ears because he was a stray. The reason he got, well, the reason he ended up with me, because I wanted an indoor cat. I I just fell. You know, like so many people get like, and they get pets. They get some pedigree or some beautiful cat, beautiful cat or beautiful dog. And I got my cat, my Ricky, because no one else would have it. I was always gonna get like a dis I don't know, a disabled cat, you know, a cat that needs extra care. Um, Because I, you know, I had the spare income, I had the house. I really want an outdoor cat because I don't live in a super safe neighborhood for cats. So he's an indoor but only cat. But he has to stay indoor because he can't go out with the FIV. If he goes out with the FIV, he could infect someone if he gets in a fight or even if they bite him. But it's. It's, it's, it's manageable, it's a lot more, um, compared to uh, HIV apparently, like the, the terminal phase of FIV, it's a lot less uh, aggressive. They will say like with um, HIV and FIV, um, diseases need strong hosts, right? And uh, cats and humans get these horrible diseases because they're really strong. It's very hard. This is gonna sound weird. It's very hard to kill a cat. Oh, he sneezed. <laughs> so what happens is he gets a lot of these little infections. Um, so we have to give him antibiotics. Um, and uh, but we have other things as well. He he. So sometimes it's not an infection. He's also got. Feline herpes, he's super fucking gross. Um, which isn't as gross as human herpes, I suppose, but he has like outbreaks, like little breakouts. Um, a lot of it's like respiratory based, so he'll. Uh, he'll just get his throat a bit, like closing up a bit, and he'll get some sores and whatnot. A lot of that you can treat with. Um, Without giving him hardcore medication, we got some silver vine uh, and some catnip. Catnip's really good for it, so he gets to get high a bit. Silver vine's silver vine's an interesting one. That's like um, it's a root. It's like a stick. Like a come, you can get it in a stick where you get it, like carved up. And uh, but with the stick, uh, like he, he'll chew on it. It's a uh, natural. Uh, mosquito sting um, like reliever in nature so what <laughs> you'll see him do it he uh, oh, he's going away now he's popped down it's because I'm talking too much the cat loves me but he does not like listening to me too much or actually no he's sitting there he's, he's sitting on my exercise mat right now obviously you can't see He's just chilling. He thinks that uh, this means we're either going to go to bed or we're going to go get him some food. And we're going to do neither. I'm going to be up for a while now, Ricky, so don't worry about it. Yeah, Sylvine, it was like, um, he'll chew it, right? And um, it, um, it releases, I guess, some chemical that like relieves bites like the itchiness of bites so you'll see what he does is he'll chew the silver bite and then if he's got any kind of sores like coals I guess cat coal sores he'll um, rub into that but you see he'll use little paws to like rub it over his face and whatnot it's really clever owls are clever like that man they get those natural claws 
like like with uh, you know dandelion and dock leaves, not dandelion, uh, stinging nettles and dock leaves. It was natural kind of relieves. Yeah, I, I did not start this stream to talk about my sick cat, but he did immediately start sneezing. So I actually wanted I. I'm trying to kind of psych myself up for full length videos where I talk over things and talk over games. Right now, I think the video we have is I have some video, like classic commercials. I think these are NBC commercials from 90s, 80s. This is an advert for Clint Eastwood's The Honky Tonk Man. I wonder if the wrestler got a bit angsty about that but yeah I had a few things I wanted to kind of like try out I want to make full length talky videos uh, I'm gonna have scripts for them but I want to kind of freeform them as well yeah that's a pretty good financing on it on a car man I'm getting distracted by the fucking background stuff dude things were cheap Huh? <laughs> yes, yeah, so. I guess. I, I want to kind of chat and think about. One, journalism, because I'm. I don't know if I'm. I don't think I'm a journalist. But I'm completely journalist adjacent. I'm. In the space I'm reluctant to go myself a journalist though I will break the occasional story I don't think I ever broke story first so I don't think that makes me a journalist I think I'm a content creator I think I'm a reporter at best which I think it's a useful word I think it gets it became a synonym of synonym with journalist thanks to Americanisms, but I think it's actually quite a useful term, because I report the news, I don't break it, or I don't create it. Um, but I think a much safer term is probably content creator. I, I, I'm essentially a copywriter for the news, in many ways. Because journalism isn't in a good place right now, and I think the it's mainstream journalism that's the fault of that. It's not in a good place. People don't trust journalists. I think putting journalist in your name is both a it's a dangerous thing to do and not because journalists are bad. I, I really applaud the work of real journalists in both the esports space, the gaming space and anything else but it's worrying when I think people don't trust an entire profession And I guess I, I make my money in the space, so I guess I need to worry about that. Um, and right now it's hard to not feel attacked if you are in that space for your integrity and the things you're doing. Because for the most part, people are just trying to, trying to report the news accurately. They're trying to do things right. And I think that it's hard to be a a big J journalist right now because it's hard to be uh, I guess I guess at some point in uh, the minimal levels of teaching people emerge through school with minimal levels of education they get taught that journalists have to be unbiased which wasn't what I was taught at school I guess um, I don't know where this pedestal of unbiased news became. Uh, instead, where I got taught was that news was always bias of some kind, and it was up to the breeder to diffuse the bias. This was kind of one of the main things with, um, we did a lot of history in school. Um, and that might be a bit difficult to understand for an American audience who do like, you know, they only have 200 years of history, so. <laughs> it's 
it's hard to uh, imagine that you might spend a huge amount of your education on history. But um, I would say that British history teaching, UK English history teaching is very biased, but it is also one of the tenets they try and teach you is, or they did at least when I did, God, when did I study history? Between, I guess I studied any kind of graded history between, I guess, 98 and 2008. So you would have, a lot of it was source work. Source work was the foundation of this education, and you would have these sources, you know, like first hand, second hand sources. Um, so, a first hand source would be like a primary account, like someone writing in a diary or an interview directly at the time, and, um, or even like a recording of something that happened or a, or a video of something that happened, and that would be a first hand source. And so, you can usually judge them as quite reliable, especially like an unedited video back then or something like that. And then you would have second-hand sources, which is like someone writing about it from an interview speculating back then. And you would have like news sources and the, the, what you would always have to do, you would get taught through his, the history teaching that you had to identify the bias. Um, and there was never this kind of like, oh yeah, there's uh, infallibility, there's not a, a bias. It's always like, there is always a bias. So say you would have a news piece about something like... Um, Gallipoli, um, which, uh, you know, British fucking education, always hear about shit like fucking Gallipoli and fucking Dunkirk and all that kind of stuff, you know, all these like miserable defeats we suffered, but like got spun around. I think maybe that was the point of it, I suppose. I don't, I think it's kind of lost on us though, because of the, <laughs> the bias in the teaching, but the whole point of teaching us about like Gallipoli and Dunkirk, if you are from a, a historical background would be to like, they are painted in our media very much as these big, uh, not victories obviously, but like triumphs over the greater, you know, oh, we, we got all those people out in Dunkirk. I mean, Dunkirk's a massive loss. It was a huge fucking loss. We got routed from the continent. In Gallipoli, it was a fucking massacre. I had um, one of my great uncles was at Gallipoli. He was a, um, I don't really know what the military was, but I do know that he was, uh, he has his great story from Gallipoli was, uh, he was said was that uh, he got shot in the arm. He got shot in the back of the arm. And uh, for the rest of his life, he had like one arm short than the other because he went for his bone, took the bone chunk out. Um, he got shot in the back of the arm. And his joke was always, well, Got shot in the back of the arm, so you know which way I was running. <laughs> I think that's a. We get to. The, going back to the whole point of this was the. Um, the sources, right? So you would have like the. We would see like the German sources of this, like, uh, or the Turkish sources or whatever. It'd be like. You know, Allied forces pushed back or, you know, on the route. And you'd be like, oh, well, obviously, there's, there's a bias there. And then you'd look at the British one and be like, oh, yeah, you know, great. We, we managed to get out. Great, great triumph. And you're like, oh, yeah, brilliant. But, yeah, you were supposed to be identifying the bias. Um, but I guess it's hard because there's all this ingrained patriotism and whatnot. But somewhere along the line, like, that kind of teaching just seems to have disappeared and now everyone's like well journalism always has to be unbiased and no god no some of the best journalism i've read is sycophantically biased the two people i put on a pedestal really as a the two people that made me think i wanted to be a journalist were grantland rice um and Hunter S. Thompson. Let me make sure I'm... Because I want to get up uh, the Grant Lyon Rice one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Grant Lyon Rice is a sports writer, in case you don't know. Uh, happens to have a publication written, uh, 
uh, named after him at the moment. But he wrote elegant prose in an era of sports writing that I guess just didn't have it. The most famous thing he wrote was the Four Horsemen. It was a, a reference to the the 1924 Notre Dame for, uh, Fighting Irish. And their backfield, these four backs, the Four Horsemen of the Hospital, uh, Four Horsemen of the Hospital, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, Notre Dame versus Army game when those mattered. They don't fucking matter anymore, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Imagine Notre Dame versus Army today. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I'm, I bet they still play. I, I don't follow college football as much anymore. I bet they probably occasionally play. Um, he would. Uh, he was just a very elegant writer in a in a, in a game that didn't really need it, or, or no, a, a field that didn't want it. And then obviously, Andre S. Thompson is. Uh, everyone knows him as the Gonzo journalist, but it's his sports writing and his. Investigative, I guess investigative journalism isn't really the word for it. Hanging out with the Hell's Angels for two years isn't investigation. I guess it's just what you do if you want to do it. And like getting threatened and all this kind of stuff. He was just being himself and writing about it, I guess, to a certain extent in that. There was a journalism element to it. and then, But when he get, becomes like the sports reporter for Rolling Stone and is barely reporting sport. I'm not saying I wanted to be Hunter S. Thompson. I, you know, I suppose when I was an adolescent, like 15, 16, I was like, man, yeah, let's be the, I want to be the cool drug reporter. But no, I, I, that, God, fuck being the Hunter S. Thompson of esports. What am I going to do? Like hang around and get drunk at fucking expensive arena bars and fucking do Adderall and snort coke in the back rooms. That'd be miserable. Although I, 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 yeah, there's people already doing that, but not necessarily writing about that. Maybe that's what you do post career. Because nowadays, imagine fucking trying to write about being a, a drugged up reporter. Nowadays, you'd just be fucking laughed out of the business. It's like, yeah, you know, just fucking doing a line and then. Having a bizarre interview with Simple, that'd be great. Nah, fuck that. You'd, you'd be laughed out of the industry right now, sadly. Well, it'd be fucking, at least it'd be interesting. It's funny. I, uh, want, for, for one of the publications I write for, I'm on 10 cents a word. And, uh, that was what, uh, Hunter S. Thompson was on for Rolling Stone in 1974. Same rate. Um, It's funny. It's I guess it's funny mainly because like he was like living like a comfortable living where he you know he could fucking afford like a Buick and fucking large quantities of drugs and I'm <laughs> I'm barely covering my fucking mortgage. <laughs> I can have cheap beer and barely cover my mortgage with the same sound. Isn't isn't inflation a wonderful magical thing? Fucking incredible. Inflation even affects uh, black market goods, clearly. But, um... Yeah. Journalism is a weird place, huh? I think, fundamentally, it's because... In the English-speaking world, we are very US-led. Um, there's two things that happen, right? And I want to divide these up. Um, first of all... The editorial system changed. I think in about in the, the mid 90s, um, we had this birth of the celebrity editor in the UK as part of the tabloid newspaper. As tabloids started doing like more ridiculous things, the editor started having to ha be responsible, um, not just legally, but they would appear in news themselves they would be reported over like oh no um the editor of the news of the world he's a uh, he's you know okayed this piece that shows the actual fucking you know naked body of famous person so you would like um 
suddenly these people like Piers Morgan, who's obviously the big famous one, who come to a front. But I think this started the trend of what we have now, is that the best way to be a journalist is to become, not just a journalist, but like a, someone who actually makes content, is you need to make content in a news format, is you, you need to become as famous as possible. Um, I was watching the Race for World First the other day and someone said this about casters and commentators. I think it was Valoris um, said this about casters and commentators and and I thought, yeah, well that's yeah, that's what this is now. We need to no one buys newspapers anymore. Like we need to get people eyes on websites, man. To get that ad revenue, to get anything. Um because I had reference you got fucked. I don't know how many people know this, but like what happened is like in the mid, we basically oversold ad revenue. Well, the ad revenue companies kind of fucked everyone. Um, they were basically lying. They were inflating all the um, the figures, yeah. Um, in the kind of early 2010s, whatnot, everything got inflated. I, and I only kind of know this from getting in on the tail end as like working in marketing later in that. Because what happened is like mid, by the time we got to about 2015, there was this tilt to video. Everyone in the room is the tilt to video. Um, everyone tried to get video ads. Oh yeah, you know, you know, people watch videos. They don't read text anymore. So all these like big publications fired all their writers, all their staff writers, and they were going to make videos. And then it turns out every all the fucking like ad companies and the revenue companies were lying about that. It's like, oh yeah, no one watches these videos. No one gives a shit. No one fucking watches them. Uh, and they were just lying about the metrics because they were like using like impressions. Impressions are kind of dumb because impressions is just you've seen something like I you, you scroll through a fucking Facebook feed and you don't even like register what happens and then you've made an but you've you've given an impression on that. But eventually, you know, it, you know, advertisers got wise to it and the people selling the ad revenue, the people who put in their ads on this, they just fucking figured out. They figured out that it was bullshit, um, and so there was this slow tilt back to um, text. Because they realized, like, if someone, you know, people don't watch a four minute video or, like, they'll skip through it, but, like, you know, sometimes people spend, like, 15 minutes on, like, an article that's, like, 500, 600 words. Everyone reads different speeds, so that's not a fucking disparaging thing to say. Um, or sometimes you read things twice or three times over, like, or on long form articles, man. People just hang around. I'll have a long form article open, maybe for. You know, maybe it's going to be 15, 20, half an hour to read like some fucking huge article, like 3,000, 5,000 words. It's a huge article, longform.com or whatever. And um, I guess I'm looking at ads during that for like all of that. So what's the value of that? And is it one impression? It's, it's bizarre. Um, and I think that the, the so so basically the, the the best journalist is the famous journalist now. And this started in the in the nineties for the in the UK. This is the only spectrum I really kind of have. No, you think about like who were the big columnists that are now big personalities. Think of like think about Clarkson, man. Jeremy Clarkson was a. Was he was he just the guy who wrote about in AutoZone for a while? But he had like he had TV bits, but he was like a columnist as well. Um, he got on TV. But the best, the better example, I suppose, from an esports perspective and gaming's perspective would, would be Charlie Brucker, as in you know director, writer, whatever for Black Mirror. Charlie Brucker, comedian, uh, comedy writer. Where did he start? He was the he was writing for. PC Zone, my favorite PC magazine of all time. And PC Zone, um, I think he was an editor there for a while. But again, the celebrity editor, man. Obviously, like these are talented people, but um, it gets to a point where, like, being the person you are, who has some clout, has some social media fucking presence. 
Well, clout, even within an industry, becomes a thing. Like, you know, how many people first tuned into Top Gear, not because Top Gear was Top Gear, but because it was Jeremy Clarkson. And then later, it becomes this whole thing with, uh, you know, the fucking rest of them. And um, same thing with, like, uh, Charlie Brooker had a bunch of TV shows that I only watched because he was a part of them. Um, that's how I watched Black Mirror. I wouldn't even give him Black Mirror a try if, if he hadn't his name attached to it. And that extent, and so much more in like an, the online era with online content. Man, if I see like a piece of a content creator that I like um, on, or if it say it's like a, a smaller content creator where they interview a bigger person, I like the bit bigger person. It's like, yo, let's just watch that. Um, I think some people are doing. Some people have like nailed this. I think OTK, One, One True King, have nailed this with S Fan, uh, Rich Campbell, Asmund Gold. They they figured out Miskiff, of course. Um, they figured out what they're supposed to be doing. They got Sl Jay Schlatt in. He's a big um, personality guy, uncancelable Jay Schlatt. Um, which probably isn't true, but you know, he does what he does. But yeah, I, I had another thing about journalism that I was going to talk about. I think it's the culture. It's the culture in different countries. I think that journalism fundamentally went through a transformation in the... Obviously, like, like most things, went in the 30s and 40s because of censorship. So... Obviously, for obvious reasons, there happened to be a war on, we were going through government censorship. And so, what happened was there became this mentality of just reporting things. And a lot of journalism that was quite scathing pre-war, um, for instance, say, like in the UK and whatnot, went very reserved and factual but also like leaving out details that they didn't want to leave out because it was essentially also propaganda on this kind of stuff after the war censorship subsided and say if you're in france germany even well, less in germany at that point but extensively like later and in england when censorship went out obviously the opinions came back and suddenly there was just this flow of opinions and i think in america the censorship style of just facts of only letting people know what has happened and this kind of lack of opining didn't come back until maybe the 80s and like 90s really and they had this whole period of just like and then they had this like weird culture of like expose like tonight on dateline we're going to expose something so all their in their all their journalism became this like exposing the truth um, instead of just opining, um, whereas like in the rest of the world, like you ask these questions, like I think there are counter questions that are added. Like if you go into, you read like a German newspaper or a, a French newspaper, it's always like why or this is what happened, but why did it happen? Or this is why it happened? Or or it happened because of this or this kind of stuff. They try and like. Um, explain things culturally and opinionly not opinion that's that's not even a fucking word michael um they add substance and i don't think there's any substance in there hasn't been substance in the uk in american reporting outside of um the gonzo journalism movement and the kind of Sports Rising, ironically, was the place where it actually started to move. Um, and maybe that is the influence of the people like Grantland Rice, where sports reporting was so... I guess it's kind of benign in many ways. Because um, it's sports, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it obviously does matter, but it's kind of... It's got that kind of pass where it's like, oh yeah, it's just sports, it's just for fun. So you can you can experiment there, it doesn't matter so much, huh? And um 
they were experimenting. But, and that's how you got your Hunter S. Thompson writing at his sports section for fucking Rolling Stone while, you know, panning the Nixon fucking presidency. You just get that kind of stuff happening. And, um, I guess eventually the American reporting, little r reporting and little j journalism infected the rest of the English-speaking world until you only had to be objective and the only real other type of reporting you could do was this kind of um, expose stuff. You couldn't have a fucking sway even if you wrote for a fucking like a right wing or a left wing newspaper, you can't write, you can't. Actually, no, like you write for a right wing newspaper, you can just do what you want still because it's just whatever. But you know the amount of shit that like the Independent and the Guardian gets for like the same shit, the Grawny ad, which still to this fucking day has spelling chip errors. By the way, I've the only thing that's ever stopped me submitting stuff to the Guardian has been that. There's no fucking guarantee they'll fucking proofread my stuff. Not that it needs proofreading. I'm a, you know, a marketable, reasonable author who doesn't... Author. Writer who doesn't um, make many mistakes. But imagine getting published in a national newspaper and there's a fucking spelling mistake. I'd be... I'd be mortified. Oh, well. I think people just don't come through. Breaking into journalism, that's the other thing. You're going to learn more in your first six months of work than you ever did. But I still think everyone should go to university, right? So you're going to learn more in your first six months of working any job than you did in your three to six to whatever, how many years you, of university you do. But... I always recommend university to everyone. I think everyone should go, 100%. Um, I think there's a few things that end up lacking from non-university graduates. Not all of them. I think that for everything that I'm about to say, there should be an asterisk next to it that says, some people get this anyway without going to university. The first one is just emotional maturity. Three years is a long time, and a lot of people come out of three years um, much more emotionally mature person than they do. So you take an 18 year old and they come out and like, what is it, like 21, and they're just able to function a bit better. <laughs> um, for me, that wasn't the case. It took another three years after that. So, you know, I'm like 24 by the time I come out of my second stint at university. Um, and yeah, I think I was basically a fully formed human being by the time I was 26. It's going to take people different times. Um, but maybe that three years helps, huh? Give them that three years. The big thing is writing skills. I'm not saying that people can write a lick when they come out of university because you are going to need that another, that six months, that first six months of paid work where someone actually gives a shit how you write. Otherwise, you're like, like, and they just call you in it and they'll be like, no, this is wrong, do it fucking again. Which just doesn't happen in university, really. Um, but doing that for someone who hasn't graduated, I've, I've edited for people who haven't been to university and it's just like, they can barely string a sentence together and you're like, you're teaching them how to write effectively still. Because <laughs> you don't come out of like sick form or even like, year 10 or whatever like being able to write really um communication in general as well like um it's rare to see someone who can communicate them their points of view and their attitudes well if they haven't been to higher education additionally um I think that what university forces you to do is to look at multiple sides of view, like points of view. The other thing I was talking about earlier was with sources and whatnot. I think that what university does is like, there's a lot more situations where you can go, um, or, or where it makes you sit down and go, um, 
right why don't you argue for the opposing point of view the point of view that you don't agree with just put yourself in their shoes and just argue for it and I don't think a lot of people get to do that they don't have to play around in that space right I think that's like in, in a safe environment as well like no, um, you can kind of like this. I remember a lot of times in university where I was allowed to put myself in a situation where I could express a point of view that was parallel to everyone else, and at the end of the day, I would leave that universe. That that uh, what are they called? That seminar room, and uh, that would be it. People wouldn't be like, you know, man. You're a Nazi. They want to be, or you, you know, you're a fucking. I can't believe somebody. How much of a filthy socialist you are for arguing for that? And um, and well, no, because we would we were putting ourselves in these shoes, and really, I wouldn't believe that. Um, and the other thing as well, it's so. University, like. At the end of the day, it's a big sign to an employer, and I, I think this got told to me by like I don't know, like my dad, by people who either by my dad or another person who actually employed people, and it's like it's a big sign and a box tick that you can do something for three years, and you can turn up for three years, and you can work hard, and you can finish something. <laughs> I mean, if that's not a fucking big tick in the box for an employer, what the hell is like? Yeah, this guy. Can at least fucking, or well, this girl, you know, this person can be around for three years, and they're not just gonna disappear. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, remember, universities make money. Um, they're they're making money off you, and you need to get in the right place. That's the biggest thing. Um, Going to the biggest, best university is not always the best for some people. I would say that a big, large, red brick university is concentrated on making money from master's degrees. Um, so they care about getting people, seeing who's going to make a master's degree and getting them through. They don't necessarily care if you're this fucking, the fuck up who is going to like do a load of drugs and drop out or get drunk and not be able to turn to lectures, they're just going to fuck you off. But that's why maybe a smaller uh, form of polytechnic might be for you, because a lot of them run on the idea that they want to graduate as many people at a passing rate as possible. So if you fundamentally just need a degree and you want to go and you want to piss up and fucking and, like enjoy yourself, go to an old poly. Go, go to like uh, uh, you know I went to BC I eventually graduated from BCU I did a lot less work than I ever did at Hull University which was my first university that I you know dropped out of twice um, because the aim at BCU was that you be you graduate they they wanted you to graduate because at the end of the day they wanted a passing rate for you and they wanted a high score on the student satisfaction survey and everything was geared around doing that and a lot of the way of getting that was to make you happy to allow you these chances and these second chances and everything like that and if you're like a person who wasn't fully ready for that situation like i wasn't even at age 22 when i went back to university um it was better and, and some of the things like if you went into that university's office and you said you had, oh, I'm so sorry, I couldn't get my piece of work in, I had these family issues. Um, they just, okay, right, okay, deferred su submission, 30 days, here you go. And they would never, like, ask you for additional things. They would never doubt you and this kind of thing. Because, and I think this was the genuine feeling that they had, um, who cares if a dozen or a hundred or every single other student gets through with some mitigating circumstances bullshit that they made up like maybe they just got drunk the night before and didn't get their fucking stuff in whatever who cares if they get a mitigating circumstances if 
the one person who genuinely had a real problem who couldn't talk about it you know like a real real problem like something that like they're like a real tragic family problem that they couldn't bring up because it was really sensitive and they had that problem but they didn't want to bring up specifics who had that problem but did get that who cares if all the people that lied about it get through because you help one fucking person who genuinely had a problem who deserved that fucking extra 30 days through and i saw so many people who probably didn't deserve that 30 days get through um with you know slightly dodgy excuses but fuck that because you know the one person who really fucking did who i knew knew about got through and now they, they got a degree they got a good job out of it and they wouldn't have got that if they hadn't had that lax thing so yeah i'm saying sometimes you go to these small universities it is not the end of your life or career because it's just another stepping stone and a lot of the time it's going to be bad for you because and i'm going to say this as someone who was a pretty fucking smart person in their little sick form and then i go to a fucking university i went to whole university for a while you know a red brick institution and suddenly i'm not i'm nowhere near the fucking smartest person in the classroom i'm like not even in the top quartile or fucking half aisle or whatever the fuck you want to think i'm just another guy who has to work 10 times harder to even be at the top level i want to be and then i go drop out and I want to play American football and I do all this fucking drinking and partying because I'm not the person I thought I was. I thought I was the smart guy and clearly I wasn't. Not fucking a deal. You go to BCU, you go to little, little polytechnic and suddenly you're back to being a, a big fish in a small pond or at least being a medium fish in a medium pond with lots of medium fish and suddenly it's a little bit more comfortable man you gotta find the right place for you and you'll find like some of the people that graduate from these top universities are pretty fucking insane by the time they come out you just push yourself to a point of breaking and what do you get the same thing that I got well not even the same thing I got probably the worst position that I got but yeah I don't know. I've been ranting about things. I think this shows I could talk though. I hope this is cogent. Testing these kind of videos out. I would really like to, to get more video content out. And if not, whatever. Oh well. Anything else I was going to talk about? Nah. Well, I've been writing, writing, reading, talking, doing things. I've been talking for a bit. About 40 minutes, 30 minutes. We'll figure it out. Probably going to stop talking now. Let it go. Said what I said. If you like it. Yeah. I'm hopefully going to get my stuff out on the uh, channel I'm working on pretty soon. If you did like listening to my rambling for a bit, um, the things I'm going to put out on that channel are going to be a lot more cohesive. Um, it's going to be about video games and old television shows and shit like that. You know, all the good stuff. All the good stuff that I like. Um, and they'll probably have more editing than this. Um, so you like those, yeah, you like that kind of thing, that's what I'll be. I'll link it in my Twitter and on this YouTube and stuff when it happens, but until then, enjoy. And I will, uh, I'll maybe have another rant soon. You get another rant soon. Another rant soon. The promise. More rants to come. Peace.